Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Eady, and I'm the online media manager of ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled, Learn the 11 Habits for Highly Successful Business Process Management Programs. Today's featured speaker is Bruce Partlow, client partner, BPM Solutions with IBM Software Group. Bruce has over 20 years of experience helping customers improve their business processes, 10 of those being with IBM. He has been focused on BPM projects and maturity for the last three to five years, making significant impact at companies both big and small around the world. The webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the Q&A session. So make sure to submit your questions in advance using the question feature on the webinar software. I'd also like to say thank you to IBM for sponsoring this event. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Bruce to get us started. I'm going to go through the, uh, the collection of 11 habits of successful BPM projects. Uh, we've been collecting this for, I guess, almost a decade now. And uh, frequently we get these questions from customers as, how do, you know, how do I be successful? What's the patterns or best practices? There's a variety of ways the question is asked. But really, <clears throat> we, have, we have collected from our customers, both big and small, these uh, successful patterns or habits uh, that really are characteristics of, of organizations that, that uh, really are able to drive BPM adoption and success in their organization. So, you know, at IBM, we believe that BPM is about helping customers improve productivity of their people. Fundamentally, that's what it's about. It's about, um, you know, providing innovative software and expertise to engage business process owners and their participants in every aspect of process improvement. And that's an important point, that holistic view. Because at the end of the day, if you're in IT, you can never know as much about the business process as the people who are actually in it. So part of that, uh, from upfront discovery, documentation uh, of the business processes, all the way to the actual construction, uh, we, we strongly believe that you need um, uh, the tools and capabilities and the methodologies that enable you to engage and stay engaged with the business throughout the cycle. One of the continuing uh, uh, points that we find is the collection of the right business data and metrics that are used to measure and identify the areas for process improvement are very important. And our focus of business process improvement initiatives is putting business engagement first, and that has, has consistently uh, yielded the most transformational results for our customers. The things that I'm going to go over today was uh, loosely based on this framework that was suggested by the famous author of Stephen Covey, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Whether you've read it or not, the basic point is that uh, that he makes is that you have to uh, that you have to have a paradigm shift in order to be effective. That you have to think about things differently. You have to approach your problems in a different way. And there's a progression and stages that you need to go through in terms of building up both your capability to become more effective and your and and the ability to take advantage of that. And the first stage of that, uh, in his book, his example is working on yourself as an individual, being individually effective, and as it progresses to being someone who can have effect across others or within your organization and community. We believe that BPM is is very similar to that. When you look at the levels of BPM success. You can't just jump to the top. Um, you know, uh, if you've not, if you don't have a BPM program in place, if you haven't done the basic learnings, you can't just declare a center of competency in your organization. And henceforth, we are going to be improved in our processes and our and, and our efficiency, effective uh, by command at the top. It, it just doesn't work that way. The reality is that you have to build it from the bottom up, and that means you have to learn. Uh, the basics of each level, and with each level, you, you'll find that that level supports the, the, the next level of maturity and the next level of growth. So starting with the ability to deliver successful products is, a, is the first point. If you can't deliver successfully in a rapid and value-driven approach, then you have no hope of a leveraging BPM across the enterprise. Uh, it will just become a huge money waster, a time waster, as opposed to being really transformational. And remember that success breeds success. You know, once you have wins, people will come out of the woodwork to be part of additional wins, and that is a consistent thread that we've seen. Some people refer to it as being viral in the organization, but case after case after case that I see with customers that are highly successful, that really are transformational, it doesn't start with a super integrated grand strategy. It starts with 
dealing with a tactical business issue and being highly successful with that and then replicating that success throughout their organization. So one of the key questions you'd ask is, you know, what are the habits that will help an organization move up these levels? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The first one, as I said, you know, successful projects and, and delivery are, are critical. So the first habit we want to talk about is proving your business value first. Don't focus, uh, don't forget to focus on your business value. Be willing to make trade-offs for your first release. Um, you know, this is kind of the antithesis to the Big Bang Theory of, of let's gather all of our requirements, let's build this huge waterfall approach, and let's analyze everything to the, to the nth degree and then deliver something two years from now. Um, that, that, that really makes it very difficult to prove your business value and, and to associate your business value and its true impact to the business. So, you know, don't, don't do too small a project, but you need to do a project of sufficient size uh, that you can learn how to deliver these projects, but also, and most important, it has to be associated to, to the value and bring balance to that value equation. While you can do lots of things, an example being is that you can put a lot of time and effort on the beautification of the screen, does the beautification of that screen really have any impact in the person doing the work? That's an example of a trade-off. So you can do the beautification of a screen in a subsequent release, not necessarily the first release because you want to drive out that first release quickly and drive that, that first level of success. Well, when you, when you look at it from our perspective, um, you know, we've developed an iterative methodology to help to, to do this, and this is common knowledge in the BPM world, is that the waterfall approaches just don't work. The, the approach of gathering lots and lots of requirements and huge amounts of documentation and then passing it to a team to do a design and then disappearing while you code, and then 18 months later returning to the business with the solution, that's just not, that's just not feasible in today's world. Uh, by the time you return in 18 months, the business needs have already changed. The process has already changed, and the business, it, it, you're just missing the mark once again at delivering the things that IT IT's always delivered. So understanding that you need a highly iterative process, one that is measured in weeks, not months, I think is one of the, the, the key solutions to, to one of that, to really effectively having that first habit be successful. Iterations over multiple uh, iterations multiple times over several weeks, continually engaging the business is very, very important. Uh, generally, when we do our projects, we tend to operate on a three or four iteration cycle. And part of the argument is that we want to downscope the work we're doing to fit within a 90-day window. And not to say we never do projects larger than 90 days. We do. But if it's more than 90 days, we start to question whether or not we're trying to do too much in the first cut. So peel an onion one layer at a time. Don't try to peel it all, all at once is, is the key message here. The next key habit for BPM success and, uh, is really making BPM about productivity and visibility. Metrics, KPIs, SLA should be part of the defined phase of that initial phase. Don't scope them out. In my projects, I tend to look at that within the first week. And I challenge the business and the organization to define what those metrics, KPIs, and SLAs are. Because if I can't define what they are, I can't make it better. If you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So that's the key point is don't scope out those metrics. And those are great checkpoints because I can use those same metrics, KPIs, and SLAs later and ask the question, am I collecting them? Am I tracking this? Do I know this? Can I measure that? And if the answer is no, in my process that I know my process is, is incomplete. And this is a mistake that I see a lot of organizations do. They put reporting, metrics, SLAs, and KPAs at the end of the project, when in reality it needs to be in the very beginning. So that's another key habit. That's habit number two. Well, when you look at, you know, what kind of processes or, uh, you know, what kind of, how our customers are using our BPM solutions, they really divide up into fairly two even camps. We have visibility processes, which are cross-functional, event-based, inter-organizational, sometimes referred to as business activity monitoring. They're finding out what happened, when did it happen, who did it, how long, how many times did we do that, and whether or not we can do that again in a repeatable phase and fashion. And the other is an automation or a workflow condition. 
Um, and that's where you've got a series of t t steps that need to be repeated over and over and over. And so you want to bring some kind of automation or control. Those are probably the most two common ways, and everything else is some derivative of these two key points. Successful customers no longer, not only think about automation and orchestration, but the opportunities to drive key metrics in both of those and to bring visibility. If you look at it from a management aspect, from a, you know, a senior executive perspective, if I could be assured through visibility that my day-to-day -day business activities are being taken care of and I'm only escalated to or alerted to those items that are not fitting within the normal mold, then I can spend my primary function, my primary time, which is to provide leadership, strategy, and vision to the organization as opposed to trying to drive and complete the basic day-to-day -day activities. That's a very transformational activity when you really look at the average executive and where they spend their time. They spend far too much time chasing what would consider day-to-day -day routine activities now versus do that strategy uh, type work. The next key habit is never one and done. And, and what we mean by that is that we've seen a pattern with some customers that they don't really bringing the rest of necessary resources to, uh, to the project. They're focused not just in driving continuous improvement. They're focused on just, I have this tactical problem. I need an application that does X, and they deliver that, and then they walk away. And then six months, 12 months, 18 months, what they'll find is in, in BPM or process-based applications are no different than any other application. But BPM or process-based applications give you the power to do continuous improvement. And if you don't, then when you walk away, you over time, that, that, that application will deviate from the business. That's just a natural thing. I mean, your business is dynamic in nature. Your applications need to be dynamic in nature. So maintaining and factoring in continuous improvement is part of being successful in process-based uh, applications. Building in and designing and understanding that you know phases two or three or version two, two or three will always happen is important, and that's part of one of the success criteria. And making sure that your trade-offs, uh, you 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 know can successfully argue to the business for lower value items to be pushed off to future versions, but as long as those they're not the metrics. Uh, that's okay, and that that gives that continuous uh, uh, improvement view, and one of continuous change. Um, now we've given this graph to some of our customers who are trying to explain to their colleagues uh, how the BPM acceler accelerates business uh, better business outcomes. And if you look at this, so, you know, when you, when you start in a traditional IT-driven or code-based uh, uh, solution uh, or application construction, you've got, you know, your first phase here, month, month zero, you're doing your program initiation. And then you have out here into the far into the future your target range of where you want to go. That one, that's the, the big ERP deployment or the CRM system or some other such big project. <laughs> But then as you uh, proceed through and you begin to, to gather all the requirements and you start to make all the customizations and the code changes and what have you, with the traditional programs, you have you know, complex tooling. It's very IT-centric. Uh, it's big, plain deployment. And what ends up happening is over that period of time, from, from month zero to month 60, you have this broad range of destinations that you could hit. Uh, you know, if the star indicates the ideal destination, you, you may end up anywhere in that in that uh, end result. And at, at usually, what ends up happening is in that last, you know, six to twelve months, there's a lot of trade-offs to try to declare success. We've all been through those kinds of projects. But BPM gives you a different option. If you start with the same sequence, and you look at the same aspect with that iterative model-driven tooling. You're able to establish those those small stars throughout the cycle, so that you're able to adjust and adapt as the business adjusts and adapts, and that's how you get to the end result. And if you think about it, it's logical sense. If you're going to drive from Los Angeles to New York, you don't look at the the map when you're in Los Angeles and say, "Good, I've got it," and then put the map away, and never look at it again until you get to New York. But if we did that, there's a very good chance you wouldn't get there. So you're going to be continually checking and rechecking, and that is really where uh, the, you know the key element of this uh, iterative approach is important because it allows you to revalidate with the business and to double check. 
That also gives you the ability to have faster returns. So, you know, I frequently have this conversation with key executives. Would you prefer to get 10% of measurable business value in 30 days versus 40% of measurable business value in a year? Well, they always ask, answer with the 10% today. And that's how, you know, that's part of how you're able to do this. If you're able to push out in that first six months your first version of the product, and you're able to, even if it's in a rudimentary form, collect 10% of the business value of that overall improvement. That's money in the pocket of the business, and that helps justify your next part of the solution. And that's how you get to the funding models to pay for iterative development. That kind of leads us next to habit number four. And I want to really stress this one. This is one of the ones that well, it's my personal uh, favorites, is don't skip process analysis. Requirements documents are not process analysis. Creating Visio diagrams documenting what was is not process analysis. Don't overdo your requirements. You need to do a reasonable uh, uh, amount in that initial phase, but not too much either. But you really need to do true process analysis. And pro true process analysis not only documents what is, but starts to ask the question why. A uh, classic example is if you look at some of the low, older brick and mortar companies that used to have multi-port forms, you'll frequently find an organization such as that that you know the gold copy goes to room 128. And as a process engineer, you chase that down and you ask the question, what do they do with the gold copy? And they receive these big stacks of gold copies of whatever they are, order forms or whatever. And for years, this organization has been collecting those. They take them and stick them in a folder and put it in a file cabinet. You ask the people in that room, why they do that, and they said, well, that's what we've always done. Uh, it seems like a silly example. I still see that stuff today. But there's more and more of that in your organization than you think. When you start to ask the question why, what you'll tend to find is you'll tend to find that multiple units or groups tend to overlap one another. They don't quite understand what your organization or your part of the organization does or, or doesn't do. And so they'll create their own process. There's an organic nature of process because the systems won't necessarily support them. You'll start to see this duplicity and duplication throughout the organization. And only through proper detailed process analysis will you see that. The next habit I'm going to talk about is taking time to deliver value is habit number five. As I said, projects longer than 90 days aren't a failure, but I would question them. When I see a project that's, that's 120 days, 180 days, 200 days, um, and those projects are fall under me, I start asking really tough questions. I start asking, why do we have to have it that way? Is there anything that we can downscope or outscope for that cycle? Can't we cut an earlier version? sooner because the longer the time you go from the point in which you gathered the data and did that initial process analysis and documentation phase to when you deploy, the higher the probability that there's going to be change. There will be change and there's deviation. The question is how big is the deviation? Self-sufficiency, in other words, learning how to do this yourself, whether you're using a chosen partner like IBM or somebody else, is important, but that can impact your, your project times. That's an example of why you can go to 110 or 120 day project length, and it's acceptable because the answer back to me would be, boss, here's the duration of the project, but also we're being expert mentored or being coached and trained through this exercise so we could do it ourselves. That's a really great answer to why it's taking longer than 90 days. And timelines can be dependent upon the sophistication of the process. And that's a general statement, but specifically, I would still ask, is there a possibility to subdivide the process? Can we break it down to smaller pieces? Sometimes you can't, and I've had projects that, that, that have run longer. But generally, I want to see those projects stick right around the 90-day window. That also forces an interesting uh, conundrum. Because everybody's under pressure to deliver in 90 days, it really crystallizes the entire team's focus. They truly focus on business value. And any conversations of whether this needs to be a 3D button or a radio button are tossed out because there's no time to make that argument. You really focus on, well, just let's put a button up there now and we'll figure it out later. That's the kind of thinking that you want when you're doing process improvement, because until you put it in the hands of the person who's consuming it, you don't really know the answer.
So now we've talked about the, the initial five habits. We're really focused on how to get our successful project out of the door. The next part that we're going to talk about is what it takes to transition your organization to that next level to you know what I call that enterprise thinking to see how you can leverage that success to have broader impacts in your business. The first part of that is understanding your team. Probably the most common mistake I see organizations make around the BPM and process-based applications is they staff it with technologists. And while technologists have an important part, they're not all you need. You have to have the interaction with the business. And if the business sponsors and owners are not actively participating on a, at least a weekly basis in the, in the project, then you have a high degree of failure, uh, probability of failure with this project. You have to have that right mix of resources. It's understanding that the best coder in the world is not a process analyst. And the best process analyst in the world doesn't code. It's understanding and identifying a good talent pool for developers. Example, frequently we're asked the question, IBM, what do you guys look for in your process uh, developers? And ironically enough, most of our process developers are not computer science majors. They're industrial engineer majors. And that's a pattern that we've looked for because they approach the problem set differently. They understand the sequential and, and task-oriented nature of process, and they can think in that way. Coding is the easy part. The configuration and building with our tool set that, that, that enables you to do this, that's actually the easy part. The hard part is how you think through the problem and understand how to approach the problem. So I've seen really, really good coders not be successful. And I've seen people you would not consider in the top talent pool for a coder be wildly successful at this. And it really has to do with that mentality. When you look at breaking down to what you know, what does a traditional project look like? So, you know, if I was to create a project, you know, I think part of it has to do with understanding the differences in the roles. Right? I'm going to focus on three key roles here. When I talk about that BPM analyst, I'm going to talk about the BPM developer and the technical. So uh, these are kind of generic terms. But, you know, the, the, the analysts, we already talked about the importance of process analysis, but having good analysis skills are critical. Some companies will just take people who used to be system analysts and put them in this role, writing requirement docs. That, that doesn't make them business process analysis, uh, analysts. Um, they're just, that's just not a good fit because they're not really thinking about what the work is being done. They're just documenting a series of events. So having someone who really wants to, you know, have those face-to-face -face uh, conversations around the end-to-end -end process and understanding how to ask the questions about key metrics that drive that process is critical. And that's really the function of a business process analyst. What I'm referring to as a business process developer here is someone who's kind of like that starting line between uh, understanding what the business imperatives are of the process and assembling the components of an application. That includes the screens and the, and the basic integration points. Um, a technical consultant really is to, to me is someone who connects your process execution engine to things outside of it, like your backend systems, your ERP systems or your HR systems or manufacturing systems, whatever they are. And each one of these roles have their own por uh, importance. If you look at a typical project, you're going to see probably 10% of the time is spent doing the analysis. The vast majority of the time doing your, your, your BPM developer, and then probably another 15 to 20% of your time doing technical consultant. And the only person who would actually write any code here would be the TC, the technical consultant, because frequently they're having to make complex and unique hand-coded or, or uh, created integration points. So that's an interesting perspective. If you think about it, what I just said, the vast majority of the work has nothing to do with coding. It has to do with leveraging the technology and assembling the components. That's very important to when you look at it from a project perspective. You have supporting roles I think that you're all quite aware of, a database administrator who's going to help us great gain and understand access to the database that we're going to create, the data model that we're going to create, but also the supporting systems around it. Your integration, develop, uh, integration or Java developer is going to support your TC. Maybe they're going to create web services into your back end or older systems. Your infrastructure administration, 
your process owners and process users. And those are the two points I want to highlight for just a second before I move on to this. Is those process owners and process users need to be actively engaged from day one and stay engaged throughout the development cycle. Companies that do that are companies that have the highest degree of success above anybody else. Companies that don't do that have about a 50-50 chance of whether the project will ever be successful. Sometimes they are, but more often than not, they're not. Let's go to habit number seven on your enterprise journey. It's making self-sufficiency a priority. <clears throat> well, I like to, to, to boast about my resources, capabilities, and their expertise, and their skill. They're really, really smart folks, and they can really help you through this journey. At the end of the day, you know more about your business than anyone else. I will never be able to learn as much about your business as you already know. And so the best way for you to be successful and the best way for your projects to be highly value-driven is going to be when you do them yourself. So setting yourself on a pattern or a path to understand that and to build that capability is really, really important. If you think about it, it means that you have to take responsibility for the things. It means you have to eventually say, I'm going to make the investment. That means you can't turn that over to somebody else, even like myself, even though I'd love you to. At the end of the day, the best way is for you to be self-sufficient. It also means that you don't allocate parcel human beings to the project. You can't have somebody who's 20% on the project. They're either in or they're out. Make sure that you have the right skill sets, as I described before, and don't mix self-sufficiency with tight deadlines. It just doesn't work. So self-sufficiency should be a goal, and it should be planned, and it should be scheduled as part of your activities, and it should be funded as such. So frequently, you don't focus on self-sufficiency for your first project. You need that first project to be a big win. So get the expertise and assistance to make that big win. And then project two and project three, get assistance. Blend teams with your chosen vendor, your expert assistants. Help them, and then they'll help you understand how to do this and learn yourself. And then over time, you'll eventually take over it all. But part of that is education. And education is not experience. Education is just that. It's education. And part of that education needs to be that you take the time and effort to invest in education, that you have a vendor or, or, or partner that understands there's different roles with different skill sets. And it's not just about the product set that you're going to use. Part of it is learning how to do that. And that means that you have to have education that's role-oriented, not a one-size-fits-all, not a webinar or, or down, download and click here, learn a tutorial. It isn't about learning how to use the product. It's, it's learning how to do what needs to get done and how the product supports that. It also means that ongoing testing and training is necessary. That just as you know, we didn't go to school and stop learning once we got out of school, education in this kind of space is the same way. It needs to be continual. Uh, that doesn't mean you need to you know, take a class every month, but it means that you need to sit down and look at the development of each individual and you need to understand where they realistically are on the maturity cycle and maturity path and plan their education and mentoring as, uh, as such. That means a combination of, the, of actual classes, that means expert mentoring, that means experience working on projects, and you move people around on different projects so that you can gain the experience and get a multiplier effect. Those are the critical elements because that's what drives you into leveraging across this enterprise. Once you've got awareness at these levels, once you've got these base levels of maturity that I'm talking about, once you've understand these uh, the, these critical elements to being successful, not only at a project level and growing your team's competency, you can now start to leverage this across your enterprise. Customers who have made this investment and who have had those big successes have grown their team, and that's how they get their CIO and even their CIO, uh, CEO to, to raise the level of awareness of BPM and process improvement within their organizations. That drives us to the next habit, which is fund of value, not your release. 
What I mean by that is there's lots of things that you can do. And the example I gave before about you know whether a button should be a button or a radio button or whether it should be green or blue, um, those seem like silly examples, but I've, I've been in meetings before where people have had those arguments. Those are not value-driven elements. Those don't add any additional value, whether the button is one color or the other, or whether or not there's pretty pictures on the screen. That's not fundamentally what the person is doing. So focusing on what the person is doing within the process and what is necessary for the person to do, that is a value aspect. And having those items as the first and most critical elements first to be de developed drives you to continuous improvement. You can add those additional elements later. And as the business changes, as they, when, and, and this is a pattern that I've seen consistently as organizations deploy their first version of a process, you get a lot of statements like, well, I know that's what I said, but that's not what I meant. And now that I see the way that this is working, I understand it better, and man, we could really use this little change or that little change. Now, do you want to know that at 90 days, or do you want to know that at two years? At 90 days, it's a minor correction that takes 20 minutes. At two years, it's a major correction that takes four months of additional development. So this is what we're talking about when we're saying keep the focus of value. BPM should be programmatic in nature. It should be one that has a continuous improvement, and, a, and you understand that the project isn't done just because you deployed it. That's just the first stage. And your funding model should reflect that as well. When you're looking at BPM, because again, BPM is business process management. It's not a technology. It's a discipline. Part of what you need to look at is, well, you know, where am I going to get these opportunities, and you know, how am I going to leverage these things to grow the organization? Part of it is tying it to your corporate strategy. So every year, every organization goes through their business planning, and they come up with their corporate initiatives for the year. That should drive you into how is that affecting my organization? What is the process impact to merge with company X or develop a, uh, the one-year movie or build a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a commodity hub? How does that impact my entire organization? Um, and that's where you would drive into each one of these process analysis areas. That is where you're going to find the value proposition. That's where you're going to get the organizational shareholders. That's where you're going to identify the key systems, the KPIs, the key error states, that process pr uh, priority. It's also going to allow you to develop the high-level business cases and determine which area you need to invest in and which area you shouldn't. And that's going to drive your process roles and your team members, your integration points, and it's also going to help you develop your cost models. As you proceed forward, and you really start to build those the proofs of concepts and, sub, and subsequently decide which ones to invest. That's how you build your, uh, your executable process and build your, your deployment. So understanding the linkages between those, if you, if you can't trace back what you're doing to a corporate initiative, is probably working on things that are not necessarily of high value. Let me give you a different look at this. So I have, I have another customer who, you know, they knew that they were a shared service from the from their from the get go. Their organization, their their BPM group, started in their shared service. So it's one of the things that they do is they go out and advocate to different lines of business, um, and they say and listen um, that they can help to drive the customer value. And we can help you drive this effectiveness and the operational efficiency and the service efficiency in each one of your different areas. And so that's what they're asking their, their end user customers or their lines of business. You know, how can we apply this in your in your particular area? They get a lot of feedback, and that's also where they get their key opportunities. Um, it's interesting that it tends not to always be the same organization. It tends not to be the organization that's necessarily driving the the biggest success at any moment, it's usually the organizations that success is struggling that they're going to get their first investment areas because that organization is looking for a way to drive down the cost or, or increase their productivity or, you know, whatever it happens to be, whatever the area is. Now, when they go through all of this exercise, they get into this, what they call a, the, the productivity target areas, and then they drive into a prioritization matrix. And that allows them to calculate based upon their particular approach, you know, what you know, a scorecard that helps them drive their ROI for each project, and that's how they prioritize. Another interesting point is that they look at the group which they're working with in that line of business, and that they look at 
what organization you know what is your organizational ability to accept change how willing are they to adopt these modified processes if this group doesn't accept change very well knows nothing about their processes completely unaware of this in, in, in reality they factor that into the prioritization because that organization has to have some baseline education before they can adapt to a, to a process based application that kind of drives us into something you've just seen. You've heard me over and over and over. I've made references to the business over again and again, and including the business as a critical element. And that's really what I'm referring to in Habit 9. You know, forcing collaboration. Consider your first project uh, carefully and consider con and, and your collaboration. Co-locate your team members. Mix them together. Leverage playback. So that's like one week or two week iterations. You play back to, to the business, what's happening, where you're at, what you've accomplished since you've last talked. You know, drive this kind of uh, uh, collaboration on a consistent basis because that also drives adoption. It lowers your testing and user acceptance cycles. It fine tunes your development effort and keeps you focused on those items that are truly oriented toward business value. Without that, when you disconnect those points and you let the business go about its business and IT goes about its business, you lose that focus. Inevitably, you come back to that. I know that's what I said, but that's not what I meant. How many organizations I've been into where, you know, the argument has been, well, that's what the requirements document said, and that's what we delivered is, is IT's perspective. And the business says, I don't care. It won't do the job. I mean, we've all sat in those kinds of meetings, and those are really not productive. Let me give you an example. I mean, here's an actual picture from a customer of one of our customers, a large uh, distributor in ph uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry. You know, and uh, you know, in this room, all those people sitting at the table are actually the business users. The IT folks are in the back. The person that's conducting the playback and walking the people through the application is the lead business sponsor. Quite a different focus. It's very interesting when the business is the one that is actually driving these playbacks and walkthroughs as opposed to technologists that are explaining to their colleagues, to their peers, their report tos how this works and it's important. It's very, very interesting to me as an observer to sit in the back and to see the excitement that generates and is driven from that and how quickly organizations that seemingly seem to be completely resistant to change do a completely 180 in, in a very short period of time and become very adaptable to change. Just because they feel like they're involved in the process, it feels like their voice is being heard, and that when they ask for something, that change is introduced and, and it's done in a reasonable time frame. That drives us to the next point, which is, you know, who's supposed to be in that room, right? It's the, it's the owners. It's establishing who the process owners are. Now, anybody who's involved in IT in the, on the call, I, I apologize, don't mean to offend, but Nobody in IT is a process owner unless it's an IT process. Processes are business oriented. They're owned by the business. Whether you want to admit it or not, you cannot have an independent third party managing and owning a business process. Unless they're actively involved in that work, they can't do it because they're not involved in it. Remember, business process management is a discipline and it's a program. It's a discipline. It's not a technology. Business process management systems are technologies that help enable that discipline. So approaching that from that perspective really helps you understand why it's so important to have the business involved throughout the cycle and having the business engaged throughout the cycle to, have, to, to directly impact the changes and, and the, uh, the development direction is so critical. All right, so we're coming up on the last point. <clears throat> seems seemingly, uh, you know, seems pretty pretty obvious, but market your work. Create internal communications about your progress. Create videos, wikis, portals to show off your process. And remember, BPMS is enabling technology. It is not. Uh, it is not BPM. So having quotes from the business users from the business owners, having them participate directly in and part of that overall announcement ongoing throughout the cycle is very, very important. That drives buzz, buzz drives interest, interest drives further work, which 
builds your team, builds your collaboration, and moves you up the maturity chain. At the end of the day, in order to, to go from wherever you're at to a highly efficient, highly effective, process-driven organization, that's only going to happen with experience. And experience comes with building more projects, deploying more processes, learning, making mistakes, adapting from those mistakes, cycling that for the next iteration. So part of what you need to do is really to, to market your work internally to be successful. So to recap, as I said, you know, the key habits, prove your business value first. It's all part of making your projects and your project delivery successful. Make VPM about productivity and visibility. Don't separate the two. Never create the one-and-done syndrome. Don't make one version of a process and deploy it, and then don't change it ever again. You need to build in continuous improvement in all your projects. Don't skip your process analysis. It's a critical function, and if you don't do it right the first time, you're going to end up doing it the second time. Because you will do process analysis, whether you do it at the beginning or whether you do it after you cut version two. That's the question. Take time to deliver to value. Focus on value-driven development. Challenge everybody, including the business, of why you have to do something on a continual basis. Why are we doing this? What value does it have? And if you can't identify the value, don't do it. That drives you into the next habits, which are how you grow your competency. You know, build a key, complete team. And understand self-sufficiency and experience are two different things. But make self-sufficiency a, a, a part of your priority and factor for your projects. Don't put uh, short duration projects with self-sufficiency goals on. They won't be successful. And lastly, how you leverage across your organization is that you fund the value, not your first release. You're focused on the return to the business, and you release multiple releases to get to that return over a period of time. You really need to focus on forcing collaboration between business and IT. Don't let them separate. Don't let them be miles apart. Put them in a room together. Co-locate them if you have to. Do whatever you have to do, but make sure these people interact on a continual basis. Finally, establishing the owners and understand that the owners cannot come from IT. They're going to be in the business, and the business needs to take responsibility and ownership of the process because at the end of the day, they're the ones that need to tell you how to make the changes. If it needs to be go left or go right, they need to accept the responsibility and the ownership for that decision. And lastly, market your work internally. Beat the drum. Tell everybody about your successes and, equally important, your failures because that's going to bring not only credibility to you and your team, but it's also going to show people how this maturity is happening and how you're growing in, in capability over time. All right, so I'm going to open it up for questions at this time. I'm looking for the first question here. Hang on a second. Project exceeds 90 days and the project is due in 90 days. What happens to such a project? It is exceed 90 days and the project is due in 90 days. What happens to such a project? Well, I mean, regardless of whether you're using process technology, it sounds like you've got a challenge with your project. You need to focus, in, in that kind of a case, you need to focus on the scope that you're looking at. Um, I don't think that's unique to a process application. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered the question or understood the question. If that person could maybe expand a little bit uh, on their question, I'd appreciate that. Uh, can you speak to the need for continuing training of experienced long-term workers? And uh, Yes, you know I, that's one of the points that I pointed out. In the earlier slides, education is an ongoing event. I'm trying to go back to the slide deck here real quick. Um, it shouldn't be, uh, you know, just product training. It needs to be an ongoing aspect. And understand that uh, even with education, access to experts and, uh, and having expert assistance periodically is important. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with experts, you know, like my field people, um, they they're out seeing lots of different customers. They're seeing patterns of problems, but they're also learning new and inventive ways to handle those. So, you know, don't deprive yourself to, access, to, to the access to that kind of expertise. So, yeah, in my opinion, uh, training doesn't stop after uh, a certain number of years. It's an ongoing and continual aspect. There's always going to be new ways of doing things. I've learned, I mean, in the last five years, you know, nearly continually new and improved ways to, to handle process issues. Can a business analyst make uh, the question that Lori asked is, in, in my opinion, can a business analyst make the transformation to business process analyst? Um, it's very dependent upon the analyst. Uh, the answer to the question, I think, yeah, yes. 
Uh, the danger sometimes is if that analyst is very attached to a segment of the business. Uh, you know, think of it in the in the terms of if we if you use an insurance example, maybe uh, maybe that person has been on the claims processing um, side and not the uh, annuities processing side of the business. They really really understand the claims processing, know nothing about annuities processing. If they get stuck in that mentality, if that's their whole focus, if they're much more uh, what I would call industry aligned or or unit aligned, then that becomes challenge. If that's not, if they've got good basic analysis skills um, and go get some process uh, uh, analysis training, we can make the conversion. And I actually have converted by a few people like that. But again, it's very dependent upon the analyst themselves. Okay, let me go to the next question. So I see right now here, I'm going to read off two questions for you and then we'll continue on on that one that you led there just so that we don't miss anybody. So um, Tracy's asking, how does BPM differ from Agile methodology? Well, BPM is a methodology as a, as a management discipline. It has nothing to do with a development event. Um, if you're asking the question, do, do we recommend that your BPMS-based projects follow an Agile approach, I would say the answer is yes. But it's a modified Agile uh, because some of the events in Agile uh, don't necessarily align to a process-based application. So even in our case, we have a slight modification, but they, they generally follow the same basic patterns. Cool. And then the next question is NOMIC or NOMIC. Uh, in an initiative-driven BPM environment, how do you justify the time taken on delivering value when the value is one team's or person's perception of the ultimate success of the initiative? Um, because the value wouldn't be one team or perspective. I mean, it's going to be coming out of the business. If you can associate an improvement to the business. Well, let me back up. So there's, there, are there foundational projects on occasion? Sure. I would not put those as my key first projects. So, you know, building, um, you know, big stacks of integration points in the background just for the giggles of doing it uh, that you're going to consume in the future is something that wouldn't be required at some point, but would that be my first project? No, that would not be my first project. In fact, I wouldn't build any integrations in advance of the process that would consume them. The process that would consume them would be based upon a business value. If I can't identify a business value that I'm going to improve, I'm going to reduce the cycle times for something, I'm going to improve customer satisfaction, I'm going to reduce the cost per claim, I'm going to you know, improve my order to cash cycle, whatever. If I can't identify some kind of measurement, that's some kind of value equation, and it may or may not be money, but if I can't identify that, then I don't have a business doing it. Cool. So we'll just continue reading these. This seems to work fairly well. So do you recommend any websites or specific training for an analyst? Uh, good question. Uh, I think uh, you've got, there's a lot of Six Sigma training out there that you could use as a good basis to start with. It really depends upon what kind of analyst, process analyst you want to become. A lot of our process analysts have gone off and got Six Sigma basic training to start with. As a, you know, those are just frameworks to approach process analysis. It's just being passionate about process improvement and understanding there's multiple frameworks. There isn't a one-size-fits-all uh, kind of approach, but just looking at all the different kind of models, that really empowers the analyst to be most effective because when you see the process pattern that appears, you can uh, apply the framework that best fits. Yeah, and Anchor asks, how do we make sure the business mingles well with IT? A lot of times we face an issue where business never wants to sit with IT, and hence most of the things are done only through emails or documentation. Yeah, very good, very good problem. Uh, yes, common problem. Uh, part of it has to do is you just got to force it from a leadership standpoint. Um, and that doesn't mean that you mix all members of the business, nor do you mix all members of, the, of IT. The realistic perspective is some of my best coders are not necessarily the most uh, personable people. <laughs> so I have to look at that when I construct the team. And that's the person I wouldn't necessarily put in day one, project one. 
So I'm going to pick from both sides, from the business and from IT, working with my business sponsor to create a team that's going to give us the best opportunity for collaboration. That's the team that I'm going to start the mix, and that's the team that I'm going to start the project. And it's interesting because when I do that, inevitably what happens is both sides, the people that were left out of the group, become more interested as they start to see the success. And particularly if you've got a wild success on the first one, that resistance to working together in the future dissipates. But I also would admit, I mean, let's be honest, folks from IT, we've created this problem, right? For the last 30, 40 years in, in, in the business, particularly in development efforts, you know, we've created a con uh, very contentious relationship with the business and the business feels they have to ask for 200 things, even though they only need 100, in hopes that they get 60. Now, we can argue why it's that way. We can argue whether it's the lack of our technology or the whatever. But the, you know, we've created that problem. We've got to come more to the business, because the business ultimately is the one who pays all our paychecks. Very good. So when you're communicating during the 90 days with a client, do you use mock-ups to show them what the screen may look like? But we do better than mock-ups. We actually do playbacks. In our technology, we have the ability to do playbacks within minutes. So we draw out the process, and we start inserting the base screens at that moment. And sometimes at the very earliest stages, the screen will have nothing more than just a description that says this is the screen in which you're going to collect the customer data. And then in three or four days, as we go continue to, to, to refine the process, we'll go back to that screen and we'll start to put some basic fields. And it'll say first name, last name, middle initial, address, basic you know, basic stuff. We'll just kind of throw them on the screen in a, in a you know somewhat reasonable order, but we're not worried about the beautification of it at that point. And that's how we have that continual, as we say, playback, that interaction with the business, so that they can visually see in their mind how they would be using it. And she's asking what technology you use for this as well. Web, Webster Lombardi Edition. Okay. Um, let's see. And how do you manage BPM when there are multiple owners or partners who do not agree on the process? Uh, <laughs> there's really never multiple owners of a process. Uh, if you are at an enterprise level, there are multiple process owners that connect to an overall process. But there's never multiple owners of a process. Uh, it just you just need to you need to if you've got a condition like that you need to subdivide further. You're not in enough detail yet of the process to identify who owns which piece. Okay, so next we have from Ted. Multiple releases is a challenge in industry where systems require validation. Can your model be adapted for smaller iterations over a long-term development project? Yeah, that's what our preference is. Uh, I like to see one to two week iteration drops every cycle. Is that what you're asking, or are you asking for longer iterations? Um, I believe that's what he was asking. Um, I'll just ask Ted to clarify here in a second, and when that comes up, we'll we'll step back into that. But we'll go on to the next question, because we've got about uh, five minutes left here. So if you have a project slated for 90 days, and along the line, you now discover that such a project will exceed 90 days due to the volume of the project. What do you think will happen to such a project, in your opinion? You need a downscope. Well, that was succinct. <laughs> okay, what additional areas of training will make for successful BPM analysis? Uh, I think we covered this one already. I mean, I, learning about various process models and process analysis techniques uh, one of the ones I, I tend to frequently suggest to start with it would be, uh, you know, Six Sigma training is a good place to start. Right. Yeah, and then, again, we have another thing on education as well, and then that would be, you know, Six Sigma and everything you've mentioned before. So what are some of the key questions a BPM analyst or a BA should be asking during the process analyst exercise or analysis exercise? Excuse me. Um. The, 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 the most common is, and then what happens? So the conversation starts with, okay, so this is what you're doing. Great. I'm looking at role one, and then and then what happens? And then what do you do? Um, that, that's a very common one. The next one is we'll ask questions like, uh, you know, what information do you need to do your job? What decision are you making at this point? Who needs to know this? What information do you know at this stage? I think part of the challenge is that people look at the end state screen that has all the information and they forget 
that it took 50 people and 100 steps to get to that state. So you want to decompose that in-stream, in-state screen back to collect the one or two pieces of data from each person along the sequence. So that's part of what we're looking for. So should a BPM analyst identify the existing process working with the stakeholders, identify key failures in the process, model the improved process, and get the key stakeholders to sign off, and then use agile implementation to recommend changes of IT improvements? Or is that a suggested or recommended? Yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about it earlier when I said my iterative development. That's exactly the definition phase moving right into it. The only caveat I'd say is that the process users don't sign off on it and then leave. They sign off on it and participate throughout the amp. That's the only correction I'd say to that. Right. Um, let's see. What literature do you refer to business analysts who want to start a business analyst business process? And what about BPMN? Well, we support BPMN in, in, in our technologies, uh, and uh, that is the, the preferred modeling method that we use. Uh, as far as literature, there's there's tons of literature on the internet. There's lots of different books. I particularly like one called Competing on Analytics, and I'm trying to remember who the author is. I don't. You, you can look it up. It's called Competing on Analytics. Oh, here it is. I got it right here. Um, uh, by um, Thomas Davenport. It's less process analysis, but it really shows you how analytics impact all of our life. And if we're not measuring things, um, we're probably not paying that much attention. Right, right. So as a BA, how do you sell a multi-phase project versus a single-phase project if the timeline exceeds six months and no scrum, oh, it just popped up on me, and no scrum methodology is in place? You focus on the value of what you're trying to correct. You know, what, what, why are we doing the project? What's the value that we're doing? And if you don't have that measurement, then it doesn't matter whether it's 90 days or, or two years, you haven't identified the project yet. So additional work to understand and document and get concurrence of the value is very, very important. Uh, how does the BPM process allow for prioritization of the failures? Prioritization of failures and problem statements don't necessarily become the priority. So those are not necessarily the areas because in some cases I can engineer out whole hosts of them. While they're important as part of the decision-making aspect, I look at those areas of challenge. I don't necessarily let them to be the driver. The real value that I want to look at is I want to look at what value I'm going to drive. So as I'm building a process, I may look at the happy path and the primary path of that, and I may look at the first exception and ignore the rest to begin with, understanding that, that all that work is going to continue to be manual for a period of time, and that's okay. So a lot of the failures will be existing in the stuff that I didn't do. But again, thinking of life in a continuous improvement and a longer-term view, I'm going to focus on those key areas first and gain control and visibility of those first, then add based upon which is the highest priority elements in the next iterations. Ah, cool. So we've got three more questions, and then we'll we'll tie this webinar up. So, what other than gap analysis can we do for process analysis? Uh, well, there's lots. Uh, you could look at as we talked about just now about the problem statements. You can be value driven. There's there's lots of different analysis that you can do. Okay. Could you send a list of the books you just mentioned um, in the PowerPoint after the webinar? So everybody knows the webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at modernanalyst.com. Um, just go there, look at the uh, webinar tab, and you'll be able to find everything you need for everybody that uh, is still listening. And the last question is, what gets into the queue first? You answered this already. The stakeholders do. But there needs to be a system for which they should do this. Agile provides this within its methodology. Which, which queue are you referring to? Tracy, could you elaborate on that a little more? She says when there there are failures in the process. Okay, all right. Now I understand the I understand the question. Well, well, it's good. again the value points of what the process is supposed to do and what you're trying to do within the process application is what gets in our view at first. Failures within the process, while are important to look at it, and they they certainly have weight in the process and prioritization. They're not the primary function, unless, of course, that's what you're primarily doing in the project. But most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time, the failures are caused by the lack of supporting systems to properly recognize the true nature of the business process. So people are people. They will adapt to what 
tools you're given. And they'll create processes that go around those tools to accomplish their work, because that's what they got to do. So discovering that true process is the first priority. Secondarily after that, once you've discovered the true nature of the process and you've got true visibility, then you're going to go back and look at what you currently think are problems. I think in most cases, a vast majority of those goes away. Not all, but some. And then that helps you drive based upon which is the most important value issue. Do I work on you know that problem that the, the one guy or gal has in the shipping department, or do I make the change in finance that affects 40 people? Which one of those do I do first? Well, I'm going to do the latter, not the former. So again, that's what I refer to as value-driven. You constantly ask the question, which is more important, the thing I'm about to do or something else? Excellent. Well, thank you, Bruce and IBM, for a very informative presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. I wanted to point out the webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. And this concludes today's event, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you, everybody.